中国的呃呃，我们现在开始了。好的。好 ，Thank you。Okay. Um, good morning and good eve. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining today's uh, APHRS Education Webinar, Pacing Module Part One. My name is Jeremy Yu. I'm the Education uh, Manager at Abbott Medical. It is my pleasure to be the moderator of this section. Today, it is a great opportunity to listen to four experienced speakers, including uh, Professor Hua Hui from Beijing. Dr. Chen Jie Wang from Taipei, Dr. Harry Mon from Melbourne, and we have the course director of the APHRS Physician Education Program, Professor Chu Pa Lau. If you have any questions wanted to ask our speakers, please type them into the chat box in your control panel. Our speakers will address to your questions after the presentation. Now, I would like to introduce our chairperson of today, Professor Hua Hui. He is a professor of cardiology, deputy director at Cardiac Arrhythmia Center at Fuwai Hospital, and Cardiovascular Institute of Chinese Academy of Medical Science, Peking Union Medical College. He is now serves as president elected of Chinese Society of Pacing and Electrophysiology, and the chairman of Cardiac Pacing Committee of Chesapeake. Hi, Professor Hua. May I invite you to deliver an opening message for today? Thank you. Hello, everyone.、Uh, it's my honor to have opportunity to share this uh, uh, course. This is a APHS a cardiac rhythm device therapy webinar series. We have a、uh, two part today. We we have three speakers. Uh, uh, all of them is、uh, very famous in the world. Uh, they are、uh, Dr. C. P. Lau, Dr. Harry Mont, and Dr. Chen Chun Wang. And following, I will introduce them in details.、Uh, today, we have three topics about uh, uh, pacing, include the basic concept,、uh, controversial pacemaker indication, and also pacemaker implantation technology and the red ventricular non-epical pacing. First of all, I would like to、uh, introduce、uh, the first speaker. Uh, Professor uh, Chen Chun,、uh, Professor C. P. Lau.、Uh, as we know, C. P. Lau is very famous in the world, especially in the field of the pacing. Dr. Lau is honor clinical professor, Department of Medicine, Queen Mary Hospital, the University of Hong Kong. He graduated in the University of Hong Kong in 1981 and received cardiac training in St. George Hospital Medical School, Department of Cardiology. Science, London. It means his main research interest is on cardiac rhythm and implanted device therapy. He has published over 500 international papers. Professor Lau is past the president of Hong Kong College of Cardiology and World Society of Rhythm, and the president of the Asia Pacific Heart Rhythm Society. So today he is going to talk about the pacemaker implantation technique. Professor Lau, please. Professor, Professor Lau, please. Yes. If you... Yes. Can you see my slide? <laughs>、uh, uh, not, not yet. Not yet. Can you please you... share your screen again. Share screen. Okay. Yeah. This is 共享屏幕 You just touch. Share your slides. Oh, it's coming. Okay. Yeah, we can see your slides. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Please. Good morning, Professor Huawei,、uh, colleagues. Uh, it's my privilege to be joining this webinar on pacing. My task is to talk about implantation technique of conventional permanent pacemakers. The scope of my talk will be focused on conventional single and dual chamber pacemaker, 
and to exclude, we do not include his bundle, left bundle branch and lead the spacing, no CLT. And um, I would like to encourage all of you to join the APHRS full device modules with programmer and virtual hands-on practice. My, task, my talk will be focused on pre-operative preparations, procedural details, and some post-operative post management. These are some of the references that I also encourage you to read. And these are APHRS endorsed document, the 2020 document on the CIED infection, the 2020 very tall uh, EHRA consensus on optimal implantation technique in pacemaker and ICD, uh, which is in preparation. And uh, I'm privileged to join this group and I really learned a lot from it. And uh, please also consider the 2017 Baylots and Reynolds uh, a chapter uh, in the book we edited on the implantation technique. Before the operation, we should have patient considerations. We have to review indication and pacemaker mode prescription and the need for MRI. And this will be reviewed by the subsequent doc, uh, speaker, Professor Wang. We should look at the patient's comorbidities, the medications, particularly antibiotics and allergy, there are important social implications like cosmesis and hobbies, and whether it's a new implant or replacement. This is just an example that a patient I recently encountered, a patient with left breast surgery and RT to the left side, and she needs an ICD. With the left, we understand is a better defibrillation threshold or right implant. We have the breast surgeon input is a curative lumpectomy, there is prophylactic RT. There was no need, according to the breast surgeon, for further RT or surveillance, surveillance, including a mammography on the left side. On the patient's factor, the subcutaneous tissue is quite tightened, and the patient preferred left sided to allow more freedom to use the right arm. So we ended up doing the left side, and it went on very well. Anti thrombotic therapy is quite important. Uh, Antiplatelet, uh, the aspirin is suggested that we can continue. If the patient is on a dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, it is suggested that uh, P2Y12 inhibitors uh, can be omitted if the patient has low risk uh, for thrombotic risk, for instance, one month after a uh, DES implantation for stable coronary artery disease. And there are some suggestions that uh, we need to continue dual antiplatelet agents. Uh, or pitching with a glycoprotein to be free inhibitors or to postpone elective operation. For warfarin, uh, once you continue warfarin, the most important key thing is don't do any heparin uh, bridging. And for NOAD, uh, the, either you continue or interrupt as the physician assessment of the thrombotic risk. Here are the data uh, of what I uh, said. This is the warfarin versus heparin bridging trial, the two study. And to throw up for you, for device surgery, independent whether it is a new ICD, new pacemaker, pulse generator change or pulse generator change with additional procedure, it's much better to do omit warfarin and not do heparin bridging in terms of leading complications. And you cannot blame your resident or fellow because with or without your resident or fellow, the risk is in fact equal uh, that you should not do heparin bridging. The right hand side to those the full two study comparing the use of NOAD versus no NOAD uh, interruption without any bridging uh, in these uh, people with a check bar score of two or above. There's absolutely no difference between continuation versus discontinuation of NOAD, but these are a group of people of that's uh, high risk of thromboembolism. They will be dictated by the uh, physicians to the operation. Propylatic antibiotic uh, is recommended. Uh, it's important to find that the patient is not in any active infection and, one, and it's recommended to give one hour before skin incision cephalosin or fucoxacin one to two grams intravenously. Vancomycin may be considered or levofoxidine in case that uh, we are dealing with allergy. The, these are the operative staff and environment. Uh, the staff should be our cardiologists with surgeon with appropriate training for permanent pacing, nurses and technicians, and anesthetic support when needed. Surgical environment, uh, either the OT or cath lab, but a septic standard with more than 15 air exchanges per hour. 
uh, is a very busy slide uh, to see this taken from Peter the Lot and uh, Dry Reynolds uh, article. And uh, I, I believe each center has different uh, level of uh, different type of uh, their setup. But uh, 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 if you have time, review it just in case you need some pieces of equipment in addition to the conventional. This is how we do the uh, incisions. The, uh, uh, the, we, the local anesthetics, uh, we usually know, use 1% lignocaine with a 0.25% uh, BUP walking, which give a longer acting uh, anesthetics. Incisions is either along the uh, delta plateau groove using the correct coil uh, process of the scapula as a landmark, or sometimes you also, some individuals, some operators also use a horizontal cut two to three centimeter below the clavicle. Both of them give aesthetically a good uh, uh, wound and also reasonable approach in either of them. So when you create the pocket, it is usually performed after the incision while the anesthetics remain active and to monitor bleeding during the procedure, but different people have different uh, their usual practice. The size should be sufficient to ensure the wound can be above the uh, pacemaker so that you are not suturing uh, at the pa pacemaker insertion site. Dissect up to the fascial pain, uh, the subcutaneous with the submuscular, submarine, and subaxillary. With the modern pacemaker, which are very small, subcutaneous is the chosen route, but on occasions we do have uh, these indications. This slide uh, shows the anatomy of the venous uh, uh, relevance for permanent pacemakers. The clavicle and the first rib, which is uh, joined at the medial end by the coastal clavicular ligament. Uh, the axillary vein causes in the arm and joins the cathartic vein becomes the extra thoracic part of the subclavian before join after the clavicle becomes the intra thoracic part of the subclavian. This is something we use in our, uh, in our, uh, in our laboratory. The, um, we use cathartic venous cut down first and there are various ways to use it, isolate it, and either we use a cut down or sometimes we can use a micro needle to uh, a micro needle uh, to puncture and with a guy wire. We usually do a uh, put in an angel cavity uh, using uh, after uh, cut down and we use the angel cavity to change to either a floppy wire or the standard wire and on locations uh, we can uh, use the same angel cavity to do an angiogram that help us to see how torturous or any blockage of the cathartic when necessary. This technique enables us to get a reasonable success rate. Uh, the cut down and immunography are technique and the cut down success rate alone uh, for both uh, lead is 62% and with immunography 82%. Um, we have uh, a success rate of 75% fully cathartic cut down. And this has been compared uh, in several studies uh, and uh, cathartic cut down is uh, equal, uh, is uh, of, of about 60 to 80% success depending on center experience. This is a subclavian puncture and uh, in the past, uh, an intraforexic subclavian uh, is suggested. This is a uh, very old uh, uh, publication by Barrow and Mujica. And so they, at that time, they championed the uh, subclavian puncture in between the, in the video end, in between the, uh, in between the uh, cavicular head and the medial part of the subclavian. This is the uh, subclavian puncture. If you want to do an extra forensic subclavian puncture, you can either do a more medial or lateral approach. The medial approach has the benefit because it will uh, be, uh, reduce the compression by the coastal cavicular ligament and uh, to the first rib and also uh, but uh, and avoid the apex of the lung but the disadvantage is that uh, it has a very sharp curve uh, at that point and there may be a bend of the uh, of, of the lead that uh, uh, the extra forex intraforexic subclavian nowadays is that fashionable an alternative is to do extra forexic subclavian puncture and or axillary venous access I treat both of them all more or less equal. The, this is again uh, taken from uh, the Belot and Reynolds. Uh, this is a puncture directly aiming at the uh, first rib uh, in the individual so that the risk of pneumothorax is low. 
So these are, there are several angles you can use, directly puncturing it vertically uh, to the first rib and then jogging your way from the medial to the lateral side. Or you can use a standard angle, which is better for the uh, entry of the lead, but then you want the risk of uh, uh, entering the lung, uh, depending on the plane. Uh, you can do venogram, you can use a guide wire from the anti-cubital ring as a landmark, but I, I, I think this technique is very good. This is a so-called AP caudal 35 degree wheel. Now, this is an AP wheel. You can see that the uh, axillary ring is in between the clavicle and the first rib, which are often obscure. But if you just tilt an AP caudal 35 degree, now the well is opened. You can now puncture uh, along the axillary vein without touching the lung. You can eat entirely out of the outside of the lung and it takes the fear out of axillary vein puncture. This is an example of a person you can see in AP wheel, this is the target site, but if you puncture vertically, it's okay. But if you have a slant, then you have a risk of puncturing the lung. It's better to do a caudal tilt and then you can puncture it directly. This is an example of a patient. So this is we aim at the, this is the AP caudal wheel. And then so we put in the lid. It's important to go to the wire, go to the IBC to make sure you are in the, in the vein rather than the artery. After the first one, the second one is very easy. A second puncture, and then you will right away, you go into the uh, IBC and then you have two venous access. It's also possible to split the shift. Also, there may be interference between the two shifts. Alternative venous access include ultrasound probe, uh, when you have replacement and upgrade, some people do the venogram, but although you may overestimate the occlusion because the subject is on, on lying uh, flat. Venoplasty, internal jugular vein, uh, and uh, sometimes occasionally we have left superior vena cava, which is persistent. Uh, the frequency of this happening is about 0.3% by autopsy. Uh, single cent experience is about 0.47%. 4, it's important to understand that the, there is sometimes also no right superior vena cava. And uh, the, in this uh, series, uh, they were able to do four of the six uh, with a left side approach, uh, you, and sometimes were in nominate way. The uh, left hand side saw one of my patients with an AVR, and this is the left subclavian, a persistent left uh, uh, vena cava. So the final um, approach is that we use a water why J curve, we are able to get uh, the lead into the electoral right atrium and into the septum. So just to get prepared occasionally, this uh, may happen, although it's uncommon. So uh, when you can enter the uh, venous system, uh, one of my fellow uh, perforated the uh, bacchial cathetic uh, junction. So this is a place uh, very tight. And so when you do this, please withdraw the wire from lip tip to avoid trauma to the brachiocathetic junction. And, uh, and also one have to avoid getting into the coronary sinus of the quick cardiac vein, which may be deceptive in an AP wheel because of the uh, good R wave, but high threshold. You need an LAO wheel to, so that it is beyond the spine. And I think the best approach is to pull left through the tricuspid valve uh, to the PA and to pull down. So this is an example. You will remove the wire and do a loop to the pulmonary artery. There is no way you can go into the great cardiac vein, and this is the safest approach uh, you can make. How often are these uh, techniques used? Uh, the cathetic cut down in the European survey is uh, done in about 60%. And as we got to the site of ventricular pacing, 50% uh, uh, use the right ventricular apex, and 47% uh, do the right ventricular septal. The white ventricular outflow is used in the minority because that uh, is considered to be a, a small area above the uh, aorta. So, so it's either a septal versus a non right a ventricular atrial lead. So uh, for white uh, right ventricular apical placement uh, is either passive versus active fixation. Uh, you use the LAO wheel to place the lead slightly behind the apex and the LAO wheel to avoid the LV or the CS placement. If you use active screw, please uh, uh, screen uh, the, for excessive rotation and use fluoroscopy. And leave a loop and do breathing maneuvers and pull IR to see stability. I, in our center, we use almost exclusively 
very, uh, the uh, vibrant uh, pacing in the septum. So I could not find from the last 15 years any right ventricular apical pacing uh, as an example. But this is an ICD which serves the purpose. You can see that uh, when the ICD is entered, it goes to the apex. And then uh, I deliberately pull it back a little bit uh, to avoid the two apex to avoid perforation. It's important to use the RAO wheel because that really stretches the ventricle and the uh, LAO wheel to make sure that it does not pass through the spine as in the case of a CS entry. And when you, and this is uh, the another uh, place that uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Harry Mon, would go into detail uh, is the septum. The preferred sites uh, in many studies are the uh, mid uh, RV septum. And so uh, you can, uh, if you, because fluoroscopy remain the uh, usual uh, location, you use this example from the, a publication uh, from Dr. Buckley, and uh, you use a grid and do the middle part of the grid according to the cardiac silhouette to get in the mid septum. Notice that in this view, this is anterior and, uh, even, and this is posterior and this is in the middle to ensure that you are not in a free wall. You normally get uh, very nice uh, QRS complexes and uh, uh, the one is negative, suggesting a septal placement, 2P and AVF are uh, upright. Uh, why do we choose the septum instead of right ventricular apex? Uh, uh, for me, uh, this is, uh, I, I believe septum is better. Uh, but uh, literature are often confusing and neutral. Uh, very importantly is the site of the RV septum pacing, not well validated. Uh, both ECG and fluoroscopic views are inadequate and uh, Harry is going to expand that in detail and to show you how to get to the right place uh, 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 um, using the correct uh, gadgets and styles and, and stylets. Uh, the duration of study are variable and there are different percentage of right ventricular pacing. The potential benefits of a septal pacing is that uh, if there is an ease of lead extraction. There is also a very low perforation and our recent study suggests that tricuspid regurgitation is also even lower. So uh, once we get there, it's important to fix it. So I usually uh, do a caudal wheel, expand the maximum, and then you see the turning. Make sure you withdraw the stylet a little bit before you turn to avoid perforation and do not rely on the number of turns. Rather, you look at the fluoroscopy. And this is uh, also the position. Keep enough slack, ask the patient to do a couple of breaths to prevent dislodgement. What about the YHO appendage? Uh, the, this is the uh, standard uh, position. While Beckman bundle and low HO subtal pacing are suggested to reduce the interval HO delay and uh, the DU's AF, this is uh, as a backup and not the routine place. Right HO free wall, there is a weak of perforation. The leaks are either active uh, with uh, much more stable or passive with lower risk of perforation. This is taken uh, from a diagram from my colleague Jojo Hai. I think when we do the right HO appendage, we should select the site. The best site is the anterior. I use the, uh, uh, the uh, clapping hands in the Muji. This is the lead will be pointing to operator in the AP wheel. So this is the best uh, site uh, with the both electrical and safety. The medial wheel, which is overlying the uh, right with left ventricular, uh, uh, the uh, left ventricular apex uh, is okay but uh, it may be a uh, lot of far view R wave activity, which may pose problem with sensing and uh, AF registration. Avoid the lateral wheel uh, in uh, yellow, because that is a very thin wall and uh, there may be risk of perforation. And never use the, uh, uh, the tip of the apex, the, uh, of the appendage, because it's right next to the aorta and you may get uh, the catastrophic perforation. So uh, you ensure the uh, stability, active fixation, stability on pulling out the stylet, which is, I think is a good test, an appropriate select and respiratory maneuver and electrical testing. So this is an example. So you can see that in AP wheel is more or less pointing towards you. And uh, in the RAO wheel, uh, so this is not just directly pointing uh, very much anterior. And uh, in the, this is the LAO wheel. So uh, this is the test I use to ensure stability. We pull out the stylet, and since it still stay there, uh, this is usually a very stable condition. And 
do the uh, breathing maneuver, you can see how the loop uh, is doing. Make sure you have enough slope. And uh, remember, the uh, sensing and pacing may change the loop and always do some breathing maneuvers and uh, ensure capture with the breathing and maneuvers. So these are the recommended. The atrial would be more than one millivolt, ventricular more than four millivolt. The threshold should be less than 1.5 for atrium and less than one for the ventricle. Lead impedance uh, is often uh, used, but this is quite industry specific uh, from 500 to 2000 ohms. Uh, an important thing to note is the current of injury. This indicates a good fixation and should be clearly visible and increase after the fixation. This will affect the sensing and the uh, threshold test, but it will improve with time. So this, you can see that this is an example that uh, case I did just recently. So uh, are we voltage of 18 millivolts and a current of injury of about six millivolts, like a monophasic extreme potential. The exact duration height of this current of injury are not well defined. Some authorities suggest five millivolts, and this may interfere with both the RV sensing amplitude and the threshold, and, but it will improve with time. So wait, do not uh, change the uh, position, wait for this to decrease. And sure enough, this is the same patient. You can see that over time, five minutes later, the current of injuries is now from six to four minutes, four millivolts per uh, millivolt. This is the con con contemporary atrial uh, 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 current of injury. You can see that it was 3.3. The current of injury is 2 millivolt. It is preferably more than 1 millivolt. Again, may interfere with sense and threshold and weight, and it will decrease. After ensuring good fixation, then one should uh, you know, do hemostasis and do the late fixation in the pocket. Uh, I use diaphragmy freely because hematoma is to be avoided. Sometimes you use a plasma braid we borrow from the uh, breast surgeons. Uh, they are very good for replacement because it do not damage the leads. I often do a thick of egg if I am doing a cathetic cut down at the venous entrance site. When you do the stitcher, it's better to do a whole stitch first uh, in the pectoral muscle and then the suture sleeve using non lethal suture because that uh, prevents necrosis to the, uh, to the muscle and uh, stability of the stitch. And then uh, the suture, uh, the device to prevent migration is an optional for uh, current day pacemakers. And then when you plug the leads into the header, ensure that I always do manual auto initiation, which also establishes uh, wireless communication if available. Clean the lead pins, wet and dry swap, avoid air and adequate screw fixation. Why do we want a good uh, a, a uh, activation. There are some devices, auto initiation may be frozen during shipment and they will not activate DDD pacing unless RE pacing is plugged in. This is a case we reported uh, that uh, uh, we use the old device uh, to back up uh, the, as a, uh, in the patients who need to have a change in box. And uh, we thought that we get uh, uh, HO pacing, but when we put in the HO pacing, uh, the new lead, we have no pacing because simply the new device is not yet active. So beware of this. The pocket should be uh, flushed with uh, clean uh, with saline or wet swap. The leads must be behind the pacemaker. The device fixation and antibiotic applications are controversial. And you close the pocket with interrupted absorbable sutures then to, ice, uh, to separate the pocket from the remaining part of the skin and then subcutaneous tissue and skin fixation. So what are the complications of placing? These are uh, a long list with both acute and uh, long-term complications. I just highlight for you this, uh, that they should be divided into traumatic complications such as perforation of the cardiac tissue and the lungs, lead related complications, uh, dislocation and disconnection, pocket complications such as hematoma are the worst. I think acutely is mainly the uh, pocket complications and the lead and the perforation. So what are we going to do this? Um, they are depending on the severity, basically, whether you do a uh, drainage to pneumothorax, pericardial effusion or tampon nut. And for the pocket hematoma, uh, we should prevent it uh, because that would increase infection, good hemostasis, and avoid percutaneous drainage because that will increase the risk of infection by 15 folds. Well, for prevention device of infection, I encourage you to read the article that was published this year, uh, the uh, EHRA guideline. Uh, what is uh, recommended is procedural antibiotics, 
the operative sites to be sterilized with chlorhexidine rather than povidon iodine based on the non-CIED surgeries. Operative technique, uh, double grafting and a boy hematoma, antibiotic envelope, vigorous hemostasis, closure in layers, and delayed re-intervention if possible. Uh, the role of uh, post-operative antibiotics and capsulectomy in a replacement to encourage blood flow are controversial and uh, uh, is, un uh, is not recommended in general. Uh, what about antibiotic uh, envelope? This is a tyrant. This is an envelope that releases rifampicin and minocycline locally for seven days to prevent bowel film formation, fully absorbed by nine weeks. In a 7,000 high risk individual, these are high risk individuals with replacement, revision, or upgrade, the envelope would reduce major CID infection from 1.2 to 0.7%. What about uh, prevention of infection with added antibiotic or other strategies? This is a 20,000 uh, patients uh, cluster randomized study. One gram of cephalazine uh, with pocket wash are the standard. And addition vancomycin, Baxi, Trustine, and two days of oral cephalazine uh, are add on sequentially. There was a 20% non significant reduction at one year device infection, or only the high risk group. So this is taken from the study. You can see that uh, there is a benefit, perhaps, uh, of using the added regimen, but uh, they do not uh, end, uh, become significant. Mind that this is a very low risk, uh, uh, low complication rate at 1%, and only 99 uh, uh, cases are infected. A very good uh, uh, places to have this device, but incremental benefit of uh, further treatment are uncertain. So here are the uh, summary from the guideline. Uh, measures to avoid pocket hematoma and avoid heparin pitching is important. Do not use procedural uh, therapeutic low molecular heparin. And antibiotic prophylaxis recommended. Primary procedural measure the surgical uh, preparation with alcoholic uh, uh, chlorhexidine recommended. And uh, avoid hematoma uh, drainage. This is the end of my talk, but I would like, uh, while we have a good, very good lecturers on the webinar, but I do encourage you to join for our APHRS modules, which is uh, Brady, Pacing, and uh, uh, SICD, uh, S, uh, Southern Cardiac Death and ICD, and Heart Failure and CLT. This would also feature hands-on practice and uh, uh, hands-on practice as well as the uh, 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 programmer and virtual reality. That's an example uh, that uh, there are something we also teach about such simple suture Today technique. I'm going to show you how to use instrument to do interrupted suture for the subcutaneous tissue in this uh, tissue block. So this is a uh, piece with the pacemaker wound, everything in situ. So you do start with the middle. And uh, in this uh, specimen, the white is the uh, fat and the uh, dermis is in pink. So you use the first knot in the middle and then cut full close to the dermis. And then the other side. Sometimes uh, we all think that uh, a lot of us do not uh, have, a, uh, have never done surgery and our tying are not uh, that good. So this is just to show you that uh, we tie uh, with the knot inside. The way we uh, cut through is with the knot inside and then uh, we have to square the knot. Some of these and others, including Venus cut down, will be shown in our webinar. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lau, for your sharing on the lead implantation. Uh, hi, Professor Huang. Do you have anything hi. you would like to add to this topic? Yeah, it's just, uh, thank you, Professor Lau, for a wonderful lecture. And uh, because uh, Professor Lau is uh, leaving, so we are, uh, have a uh, discussion now. Maybe we have uh, some uh, question from audience. Uh, May I ask uh, Professor Lau, uh, is, uh, when uh, doctor asked uh, Professor Lau, uh, if uh, given, uh, for device replacement, what is your opinion for giving MR condition pacemaker for a patient with non MR compatible lease? Professor Lau, can you answer this question? Uh, 
Right. I think uh, uh, Dr. Wang would uh, cover this uh, placement pres pres in detail, but we might uh, work if the leads uh, are MRI incompatible and there is not much chance of them uh, to be uh, become a retrospective MRI compatible in the future, then I probably would not definitely use an MRI device if there are cost differences. But otherwise, there is, if the leads are going to be retrospectively qualified, then I would go for an MRI device. Okay, uh, may I ask a question to you? Because now many patients with uh, pacemaker implantation also have uh, atrial fibrillation. All these patients take uh, anticoagulation. So for the uh, more and more patients use uh, NOAX, uh, uh, new uh, oral anticoagulation. So for your management, this patient before and after procedure is uh, how, how do you use the, the, the uh, new anticoagulation? I, depending on the renal function, I normally stop the uh, nowhere for one day. Uh, and, uh, and then we go proceed uh, with the operation and do good homeostasis. And I resume the uh, nowhere uh, the day after. Uh, I never use heparin pitching. I think that works very well. There might be cases uh, that uh, maybe with a patient with multiple strokes, very high risk of strokes before, then one may have to consider the use of uh, low molecular weight heparin, but uh, that uh, is sometimes uh, quite uh, controversial. Uh, I think the Bruce 2 study suggested that we can interrupt. Uh, in most cases, we are usually okay. I, I think with good hemostasis, uh, we have a shorter period of no interruption. Uh, we, we, we do not have much of a problem. Okay, uh, because time is limited. Um, uh, um, Shiri, I found I just, uh, uh, there is a question from our audience, which is about uh, our elite fixations. Uh, should we go for this? Uh, uh, questions uh, before we move on. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, last question. question. Uh, yeah. oh, last question. So, is uh, if RA lead is in atrial uh, RA appendage in six sinus system patients, sometimes function test result is poor. Then I consider the lead in septal placement. Is there any tip A leads in septal placement or caution points? Yeah. I think this is a good question. I, uh, the, uh, we, we, the uh, approach is uh, rather similar. We use a long curve and sometimes the curve need to have an eccentric tip at the end to point to the posterior. Uh, and then normally you get there. Uh, there is uh, one important uh, uh, trick apart from the threshold is the far field uh, ventricular sensing. If you are very low down in the septum, then uh, there may be a possibility of sensing the ventricle and then you have double sensing and you may have uh, no pacing. So this is uh, one thing to avoid. And of course, uh, this also negate, may interfere with the, remember, uh, the registration of atrial fibrillation signal uh, because uh, you have far fewer hour wave sensing, you may have double counting again and your AF counters may be uh, erroneously activated. So be careful of that. But uh, when uh, Dr. Wang and I have done, we did a study together, and so we find that this is the lower right atrial septum works very well. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Law. Because time is limited, we will move uh, next, next year. Okay, thank um, you, Dr. Law. Yes. Hey, so, uh, Professor Wang, uh, before I uh, move, uh, you introduce our next speakers. I just want to quickly uh, advertise our next uh, pacing course uh, uh, before Professor Law leave. Uh, uh, this webinar. Um, uh, so the next uh, pacing uh, part two uh, will be held on 15th of August and then um, it, which, it, which is focusing on timing cycles and uh, pacemaker uh, troubleshooting and again we have uh, uh, different uh, experienced speakers to talk about um, on different topics and I'm happy that actually Dr. Ma Su King uh, from Penang, Malaysia has uh, also joined this uh, webinar. Dr. Ma, if you have any uh, comments or I want, I want to answer the, uh, our questions from our audience. Please feel free to share uh, your ex experience uh, with all of, uh, all of us. And then um, um, uh, for those uh, who, can, uh, who attended both uh, pacing part one and part two, uh, you may apply the certificates of attendance from the APHRS. So please uh, uh, provide your name and email address to uh, uh, APHRS secretary or Flu Abbott Webs. Right, uh, thank you, uh, well, Professor Wang. I pass the time to you again. 
Okay. Uh, now we move to uh, uh, next topic. Next speaker, uh, Dr. Chen Chen Wang. Uh, Dr. Wang is an associate professor of medicine at the Chang'an University Medical College, uh, attending cardiologist at the uh, Chang'an Memory Hospital in Taipei and Taiwan. And currently, uh, Dr. Wang is attending cardiologist, director of the Cardiac Resume Center, and the director of a VIP clinic at the Chang'an Memory Hospital. And uh, he is uh, chairperson of the Education Subcommittee of the Taiwan Heart Rhythm Society. Dr. Wang is going to talk about the uh, um, basic concepts and the controversial pacemaker indication. Professor Wang, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Huawei. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the privilege to talk about this uh, topic. As you know, uh, now the, nowadays, pacemakers are getting smarter and smarter. So I think uh, I don't want to talk too much uh, about the, the detail, but I think it's important to let you know about the basic uh, electrical concepts. As to the indications, I think uh, many of you are fellows in cardiology or a young attending staff, and you know or, already too much about kinetic indications. But I just want to pull you back a little bit. I just want to focus on the known knowns, the contraindications of pacemaker implantation to let you know that sometimes some indications are not, uh, some, some conditions are not indicated for pacemaker implantation. First, let's go to electrical concepts. As we know, a uh, uh, complete pacemaker sy system includes the pulse generator uh, with a battery, circuit, and connector to accept these, and the these uh, going into the heart and delivers uh, the cardiac signal to the pacemaker for sensing, and also delivers uh, the pacing output to the heart to capture. How does a pacemaker work? The pacemaker has two main functions. First, pacing. A pacemaker will sense an electrical impulse to the heart through a pacing lead when the heart's own rhythm is too slow or interrupted. And pacemaker will also sense the heart's natural electrical activity. When the pacemaker senses a spontaneous heartbeat, it will not deliver a pacing pulse. Sensing refers to the pacemaker's ability to see intrinsic cardiac activity and if appropriate to respond to it. An important thing to consider when talking about sensing and includes the forms, um, service EKG, intracardiac EGM, sensing threshold, sen sense amplifier, sensitivity setting and setting margin, and bipolar and unipolar configuration, and electromagnetic influence. First, let's see the sensing configuration. The unipolar sensing configuration use the tip electro as the cathode and the can as the anode. So it is a big antenna. So it's uh, more susceptible to electro electromagnetic interference and to uh, the EGM interference. And unipolar these are thinner than bipolar these. But nowadays, I think most of us are using bipolar these. So we have a one more choice. Standard, we use uh, bipolar configuration. And if there is a trouble with the outer interaction, and then we can move to unipolar uh, uh, configuration. For the bipolar, we have the T electro as a cathode and the ring electro as anode. So this create a smaller antenna. So it's less susceptible to EMI and mild potential. And it's more sensitive to the cardiac signals. 
as regard to near field and far field, uh, you can see if it's a near field, that means the, the bipolar configuration, you have a sharper signal. And if it's a far field, and it's a more like a service EKG, it's wider and it's a very different. So the good part for near field or EGM is that the signal is a, a sharper, e easier to sense and less uh, interference. But in the ICD patients, it may be difficult to differentiate uh, because of uh, the, the EGM uh, with VT and sinus conductive disc may be uh, very similar. But with far field, it's easy to differentiate between the two because it's wider and can repre represent uh, uh, similar to what we saw on the service EKG. The pacemaker has a, a sense amplifier and also have a filter built in. So it tends to, it tries to sense P wave, R wave, and try not to sense the electromagnetic interference, myopotential, T wave, and far field R wave. So the filter tries to, to look at uh, things above the U shape curve and try to ignore the uh, signals uh, outside the U shape. Uh, um, um, curve. And this is a good example. We can see first uh, first uh, channel is the service EKG, and then the second channel is so-called event marker. So these uh, annotations indicate how the pacemaker interpret what it saw. So it may be different from uh, the images uh, from our brain uh, as uh, what we saw. So this is important to see how the pacemaker uh, react to the incoming signal. And then it's the intracardiac electrogram, atrial channel and ventricular channel. And this is uh, signals inside the heart. So with this kind of uh, surface ECG and uh, intracardiac electrogram, it's easier for us to see how the reason occurs and how it develops, and also to see how the pacemaker um, interpret this kind of reason. An important principle uh, of pacing include voltage, current, and impedance. As we know, voltage uh, is a, a current multiplied impedance. And voltage is the unit of uh, electrical pressure or, or force causing an uh, electron to move through a circuit. Current is a flow of uh, electron in, in a completed circuit. And impedance is the resistance to the flow of current. So um, current multiply and um, uh, pass duration uh, is the output, the energy delivered to the heart. As the impedance may be, is, is uh, the resistance in between electro tissue interface. So it's more like a, 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 stand, a, a constant thing. If it's, uh, there's no big problem. So usually we show the pacing output with voltage and pass width. And these two um, uh, things can be adjusted through the programmer. And for pacing, it's uh, similar. We have the unipolar pacing configuration from T electro to the can and, and, and peso to anode. And with this kind of pacing configuration and the pacing spike uh, is, uh, is uh, much bigger and is uh, more likely to cause uh, muscle stimulation and in the pocket side. And with bipolar pacing configuration, the flow only uh, cir uh, circulate in a, a near field area. So it's less likely to cause muscle stimulation. And also on the surface EKG, we have a smaller pacing spike. And capture is the depolarization and re resulting contraction of the heart in the atrium or the ventricle in response to a pacemaker upper pulse. And capture's ratio is the minimum amount of electrical energy delivered to a consistently depolarized heart. So the capture 
also ratio uh, uh, we usually uh, sh show in this way uh, the voltage and the pass width. If you are doing a voltage ratio test and with the fixed uh, pass width, this is the voltage capture threshold. And maybe we can um, go the other way around uh, 0 0.4 millisecond at 2 point volt. That means we are doing a pass uh, with ratio test with a fixed voltage. And then you can show the other way around. Um, for a stable uh, capture ratio, acuity, uh, we hope to see uh, um, less than 1.0 volt at uh, 0 0.5 millisecond, both atrium and ventricle. Um, just now, uh, Professor Lau mentioned that for the atrium, you can allow 1.5 volt. But if possible, I would suggest uh, to try um, change different location several times to get a better capture ratio and to get a better sensing signal um, in the chaos rate. Uh, otherwise, uh, after uh, connecting to the pacemaker, the, the sensor uh, uh, filter may make the sensing smaller, so um, sensing am am amplitude smaller, and also with time, uh, the higher uh, capture ratio may cause a, a higher uh, battery drain and, and reduce the battery longevity. And for chronic ratio, we hope to see um, both in the both atrium and ventricle less than two volt at 0 0.5 uh, millisecond. This is a very important uh, basic concept, uh, strength duration curve. Um, the strength duration curve illustrates the relationship of amplitude and pass width. Um, real base uh, suggests uh, um, that uh, with different pass widths, we can we get a voltage uh, ratio, but once it reaches a, a big uh, a long uh, duration, the voltage ratio cannot go down anymore, and this is uh, this this flow uh, is the so-called real base, and with two times uh, uh, voltage of the real base and check the pass width ratio, we get the other uh, uh, chronicity. Chronacy is uh, uh, the voltage, uh, the pass width ratio at two times uh, real base. And you can see with a much shorter uh, pass width, the voltage ratio actually rise abruptly. So an uh, important thing is that we never program um, the pass width less than this uh, chronacy. And usually uh, we, um, with conventional pacemaker, we can program two times voltage ratio or three times pass width ratio. That's for the uh, old days uh, generation in pacemaker. But now many pacemaker has so-called automatic function. Right? They have uh, the auto capture, capture management, etc. cetera. So um, it may not be so important, but once that auto capture is, uh, is not working well, and, or you have a patient with the uh, old generation, in pacemaker, this kind of concepts are very important. Don't program too short a pass width because that uh, voltage ratio may be uh, um, changing uh, uh, quite a lot. And don't program too big an output and that will waste uh, the, the pass generator's energy. Low impedance condition uh, usually represent insulation break and insure, insuration break uh, cause the decreased resistance and uh, have a low uh, impedance and increase current drain and increase uh, energy usage. On the other hand, high impedance condition represents a fractured conductor. Usually the impedance can go above 2000 ohm. And with this uh, increased resistance, it decreases the current drain and decreases the energy. So the patient may show loss of capture feature. And last about the basic concept is the, this kind of manual response. All different company has their uh, different uh, so-called uh, manual response. Um, for EBIT, uh, a pest anchor, for example, um, they in the beginning, the, um, with the application of magnet, it goes to uh, a synchronous pacing with VOO or DOO at the rate of 100 beats per minute. And with time, this kind of uh, um, uh, manual rate 
can go down. Once it's below 90 beats per minute, it's a uh, time to, to signify it's uh, reaching uh, a near end of life. And if it's uh, less than 85 beats per minute, uh, we should ch uh, change the uh, pacemaker. It's easy for a pacemaker to know the capture, uh, if it's stable or not, and also to see the uh, longevity of the pulse generator. And for an ICD, it's a different uh, um, reaction. Uh, all companies share the same manner response. They suspend tachyarrhythmia detection and therapy. And so, uh, but uh, there will be no effect on the pacing mode. Now I move to controversial indication. Um, currently we have uh, two major uh, guidelines. Uh, one is the 2013 uh, ESC and EHRA uh, pacing and CRT uh, guideline. And the second, the newer one is the 2018 ACCHA HRS uh, pacing uh, guideline. But I just want to remind you, um, when considering a uh, broad arrhythmia in a patient, other than uh, intrinsic um, uh, disease-related um, um, bradycardia, always be careful about these extrinsic factors. Patient may have a, a vagal response uh, causing bradycardia, and patient may have a drug that causing bradycardia, and electron imbalance, metabolic uh, disorder, and even some uh, neurological condition can cause um, bradycardia. Many of these are reversible, and we should uh, always check if there is any uh, extrinsic factor involving with the development of bradycardia. Um, then the patient may uh, escape from a pacemaker implantation and first, uh, let's check uh, the 2013 ESC guideline. Um, with uh, the uh, bradycardia pacing, the first uh, contraindication, the class three indication, um, they don't look at uh, the low rate, the, the duration of pause anymore. For sinus node disease, the class one indication is symptomatic bradycardia. And pacing is not indicated in patients with sinus bradycardia, which is asymptomatic or due to reversible cause. This is very important. So don't just treat uh, bradycardia itself. Um, if the, uh, we always have to check if it's a reversible or not, and if the patient has symptoms or not. And it's uh, similar with uh, acquired AV block. And patient uh, uh, is not indicated in patients with AV block which is due to reversible cause. That's very important. As for the bundle branch block, um, pacing is not indicated in, for bundle branch block in a symptomatic patient. It may warrant a uh, follow-up, and it's only indicated in patients with an sprain syncope and abnormal EPS, such as HV prolongation or early AV block uh, with the uh, atrial pacing. And also with the uh, alternating bundle branch block, um, that's an uh, 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 indication. And for this uh, uh, unexplained syncope, the tiered uh, testing may show uh, two kinds of uh, response, uh, vasodepressor and cardio inhibitory. For those patients with uh, tear-induced non-cardio inhibitory syncope, cardiac pacing is not indicated. And for patients with unexplained syncope, Pacing is not indicated uh, with an explained syncope without evidence of bradycardia or conduction disturbance. And also pacing is not indicated in patients with unexplained falls. So we have to look for other clues using uh, different uh, non-invasive or invasive testings uh, to see the relationship. And with uh, cardiac pacing in acute myocardial infarction, um, in the ESC uh, guideline, they suggest that uh, even if it's a high degree or complete AV block uh, in the early phase of acute myocardial infarction, cardiac pacing should, is, is not uh, always indicated. We may use a temporary pacing to solve the acute phase uh, condition, uh, uh, hemodynamic instability condition. But if the um, AV block uh, resolves with time, 
in the ESC guideline, they suggest a waiting period of uh, two to seven days to see if the, with the especially with the reperfusion strategy, the AV block can improve or not. And with uh, pacing to prevent or intermination of atrial tachyarrhythmia, um, it also stated prevention and termination of atrial tachyarrhythmia does not represent a standalone indication for pacing. Only in patients with bratty tachy syndrome, with uh, also a concomitant sinus node dysfunction, then is indicated, but cannot be used for a treatment of tachyarrhythmia alone. And similarly, in the 2018 uh, ACCHA and HRS guideline, there are some uh, um, modification. And they first, they have a top 10 uh, take home messages. First, um, sinus node dysfunction is age dependent progressive fibrosis of the sinus nodal tissue and surrounding atrial myocardia. So it's, it's a natural cause. So only if the patient has symptoms that pacing is warranted. Otherwise, uh, um, um, if the, you just see a, a ECG tracing and suggest a, a pacemaker implantation may not be uh, adequate. And also, the nocturna bradycardia are quite common with uh, sleep disorder breathing. So treatment of uh, sleep apnea are far more important because they not only decrease the frequency of these uh, nocturnal body cardia. Also, they carry some additional cardiovascular benefits. And uh, nocturnal body cardia is not in itself an indication for permanent pacing. And as for the depth bound door branch block, it usually suggests that the patient has a higher uh, uh, chance of underlying structural heart disease. So it is uh, worthwhile to do some more cardiac uh, condition study. And echo is a good uh, way to start and uh, to see the left ventricular systolic function. And as I mentioned earlier, in sinus node dysfunction, there is no established minimum heart rate or pulse duration where permanent pacing is recommended. So it, it's important to document symptom with bradycardia. And if the patient has the precise bradycardia, but uh, the symptom is not related to bradycardia, it's also not warranted to suggest a pacemaker implantation. And acquired second degree Mobius two AV block, high grade AV block and third degree AV block, not caused by reversible or physiologic uh, causes, uh, pacing is indicated. A very important symptom, uh, are quite important, uh, similar to sinus node dysfunction. And if the patient has a dead ventricular ejection fraction less than 50%, and the AV block, and the patient and, and are expected to require high percentage of ventricular pacing, about 40%, then we should consider um, more physiological ventricular activation, such as CRT or his bundle pacing. Um, then uh, simple right ventricular pacing to prevent heart failure based on the broad heart failure trial. Um, TAVI is a special group uh, with uh, 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 current use of uh, more and more of uh, TAVI. We know that this group patient has a high ri higher risk of developing every broad peri procedure. So we have to uh, pay attention to this group, group of patient. And, uh, this point is very important, similar to other cardiac disease. Shared decision-making and patient-centered care are always important to incorporate in, into our consideration and treatment. If the patient or the caregiver refuse or request withdrawal of pacemaker therapy um, because of the poor medical condition, other medical situation, then we should consider this is part of palliative end of life care. And even with the uh, uh, withdrawal of pacemaker therapy, it's not physician assisted suicide. Uh, this is based on a shared decision making and the patient's willingness. And the tense point is very important to us because uh, nowadays many of us are 
keen to learn, uh, keen to try this uh, new technique, his bundle pacing, um, transcasser, lead this pacemaker. But uh, just very good example, uh, Professor Lau just mentioned. Uh, several years ago, we did uh, an atrial septal pacing and atrial overdrive pacing um, randomized control trial in the Asian countries. It was published uh, in circulation uh, called SAFE trial. And theoretically, septal pacing uh, reduced a lot intraatrial conduction delay and also the technique is feasible. However, the RCT the SAFE trial cannot show any benefit with septal pacing or atrial overdrive pacing to reduce uh, the occurrence of atrial tachyarrhythmia. So we document the feasibility of that technique, but we cannot suggest it's a, a standard therapy and it's not the first priority for atrial pacing. So similarly, his bundle pacing or Lily's pacemaker, uh, we still need uh, some more evidence to prove, we need RCT to prove that it's feasible. Just look at the uh, uh, VJ Yaraman's uh, multi-center trial, you, you know, there is still some problem with his bundle pacing. Uh, some patient may have high capture ratio and some patient may develop a zip block uh, during follow up uh, requiring a revision of the device. So we better be careful with this, this kind of uh, new uh, device, a uh, new technique and here we have a uh, further proof of safety and feasibility. Um, for sinusoidal dysfunction, very importantly, if the patient is uh, asymptomatic, um, then uh, permanent pacing is a class three indication. And if the patient's uh, symptom uh, does not correlate with bradycardia, it's un uncertain, um, we may try oral steel feeling based on steel pace trial. Um, it may be worthwhile to, to try this one, uh, elevate the sinus uh, uh, rate and see how it goes. And to also using this time to go document if the patient's symptom is really related to bradycardia. If so, then pacing will be class one indication indicated. Um, for AV block, you can see there is only two class one indication. One is a complete heart block, uh, advanced AV block, Mobis two second degree AV block, which are, uh, can, do not have a reversible cause, um, and also evidence for infernodal block. Then it's class one indication. And for Mobis one second degree AV block, if the patient has a uh, underlying neuromuscular uh, cardiomyopathy uh, disease, then the chance of progression is high, then it will be indicated. Otherwise, uh, Mobis one second degree AV block and no symptom, no associate um, progressive um, uh, condition is contraindicated. We can see here in pay, uh, this is a uh, um, in patients who develop acute AV block attributable to a non-reversible or non-recurrent cause, uh, it's not warranted to do print a permanent pacemaker at this moment. And if the patient it has a, a symptomatic vaguely mediated AV block, it's also contraindicated. It's a class three indication uh, with harm because of the invasive procedure. And for patients uh, with uh, first degree, Mobis one second degree, or two to one AV block who are asymptomatic and also who are believed to have a block at the side of AV node, uh, we should not bring a pacemaker. Uh, only if the patient has a, a symptom um, or a progression, then it's, uh, it's indicated. With regard to the uh, peri uh, MI uh, condition, the ACCHA HRS guideline also recommend um, a waiting period. That's very important. And in this guideline, they suggest uh, perhaps uh, three days waiting is warranted. Uh, it's worthwhile. 
because many of them, especially after a reperfusion strategy nowadays, um, uh, many of them can resolve spontaneously. Only if those with persistent uh, Mobis 2 or high grade or complete AV block, alternating bundle branch block, and with a block inside uh, infernodal, then it may be worthwhile to print a, a pacemaker. And if it's a, a resolved uh, AV block, uh, permanent pacing should not be performed. And also uh, in patient with a, a, a QMI with a new bundle branch block or isolated fascicular block in the absence of uh, further body cardia uh, is not indicated for pacing. And we, with the shared decision making, it's important to say um, if the patient has significant comorbidity, um, pacing is unlikely to provide meaningful clinical benefit or if the patient's goal of care strongly preclude pacemaker therapy, then this kind of uh, uh, pacemaker implantation uh, should not be, um, be done because of lack of benefit. Okay, so that's all I want to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wang, for sharing the basic concept and also uh, the updated guidelines of pacemaker implantation. Uh, Professor Kwa, do you have any comments uh, to these um, uh, lectures? Um, please unmute yourself, uh, Professor Kwa. Yeah, Professor Wang, if I oh, may ask okay. a question to you. Yeah, okay, ask, please. You, yeah. I always get asked this question when I uh, talk about the management of brady arrhythmias to my colleagues in Malaysia. I mentioned uh, the recommendation of the use of oral theophylline in uh, the assessment of uh, sinus node disease, whom we are not certain where, whether the pacing therapy is going to help them. They always ask me like this, if oral theophylline helped them, why not prescribe them lifelong oral theophylline? What's your take on this, this question? Uh Yes, I, I actually some of my patients I did uh, prescribe lifelong steel feeding, but not to the uh, dose of for bronchial asthma. Usually, I prescribe a maximum of five milligram per kilogram per uh, uh, per day uh, uh, dose. And um, now we know uh, steel feeding is a safe drug with uh, this kind of a uh, lower dose. So it usually can elevate the sinus rate roughly ten beats per minute. But it's not a, a cure for all patients. If the patient develops a symptom and uh, documented body cardia later on, then pacemaker is warranted. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, we tell them that theophylline is not a treatment for symptomatic bradycardia. Mm -hmm. Because always tell me that theophylline can be, could, could it be a replacement for pacing? Definitely not. So I'd like to get this message across to my, all my colleagues. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Bang, there is a few questions from audience. Uh, so ask, him, ask you the question for them. The one question is uh, for the patient with uh, acute mouth infarction, if the patient had a block, uh, uh, complete AV block. So it's, uh, uh, the, the guideline for waiting period is how long? Is waiting for three days, uh, one week or two weeks? Is how long in your clinical practice? So how long? That, that's a very good question. Actually, for this uh, condition, I searched uh, the, the literature and there's actually very few publications in the past five years. So I still go back to the guideline recommendation for ESC guideline in 2013. They suggest a waiting of two to seven days. And for the 2018 ACCHA guideline, they suggest a waiting period of longer than three days. So I think uh, we have to uh, and uh, depend on the also to see uh, the site of uh, if, uh, the, the coronary blockage. If it's an inferior infarction, uh, we can um, allow a longer period of uh, waiting. But if it's anterior infarction, the uh, involvement of the myocardium may be more extensive. Then we, perhaps we can do it earlier. But always uh, check the intrinsic uh, um, reason and uh, on a day, day by day basis, see if that improves or not. Okay, thank you. And uh, 
uh, you know this. Uh, uh, so uh, his bundle pacing and also new technology uh, lab bundle branch pacing. So uh, any recommendation for lab bundle branch pacing present? You you what's your comments? Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Uh, since we know that um, there are some problems with his bundle pacing because of the highest ratio. Uh, that which uh, can greatly shorten the longevity of the fast generator and also a risk of zip block. So many of us, uh, our colleagues, um, move to the bundle area pacing. It's a much easier procedure. And you just go deeper in the septum and look at the service EKG. See if we can see RBBB morphology in the V1. Uh, and, and EKG, then it's a, it's a dead bundle pacing. But my question is, that's just the EKG presentation, but can that uh, convert to a clinical benefit? Look at uh, you know, what we did uh, for more than one decade. We did a septal, RV septal pacing. We see a much uh, narrow QIs and we see uh, a much better uh, QIS morphology in the limb leads. But we cannot prove it, prove the benefit with RCT. So I think that's similar situation for the bundle area pacing. We still need uh, 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 an RCT to prove the clinical benefit and the long-term uh, safety. So I don't suggest um, most of our colleagues to do it right away. It may be, uh, um, a new technique uh, we uh, keep uh, keep uh, watching and leave it to experts to see uh, their uh, publications. And okay. if I add on this uh, topic, uh, so sorry. I think the the development of our tools by um, the our industry partners and friends, they will enable us to deliver this form of novel therapy safer in the future because there are still new tools being developed for both his bundle pacing and left bundle pacing. That's my take on it, yeah. Okay, what thank you. Because, so because time is uh, limited, although there are many questions, however, we have to move the next uh, topic. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wang. So next uh, uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Harry Mond. We uh, all know him. Uh, Dr. Harry Mond is an associate professor at um, uh, both Morburn and Monash University in Victoria, Australia. He has been performed uh, pacemaker implantation since 1970 at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Dr. Mond was a <coughs> foundation committee member of NASB examination. Dr. Mond has retired from pacemaker implantation, but is still responsible for the pacemaker clinic at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. He has authored the three books, numerous books, chapters, and over 260 published uh, uh, manuscripts. Uh, I uh, learned the technology from Dr. Hermond more than <laughs> 20 years ago. So it's today very happy to listen uh, Dr. Hermond uh, lecture again. So Professor, uh, Professor Mond is uh, going to talk about uh, red ventricular non-epical pacing. Professor Mond, please. Am I on? Yes, please. Um. Yeah, Aaron. please uh, share your screen. Uh, am I sharing? Uh, not yet. Um, could you please try again? Uh, press the, the share yeah. screen button. Uh, I'll have to... Is it on? Um, not yet. Can you find uh, the, the share screen uh, button? Yeah, well, uh, on your control panel. Uh, and then could you please uh, yeah, uh, press it again? I'll try duplicate screens. Is that on? No? Not yet. Uh. Where is the... Oh, um, Patrick, can you please try to uh, uh, pass uh, the... I was... Share screen uh, to... I'll try Harry. now again. I'm trying it once more. 
and let's see, I should think it would work. Oh, maybe I've the wrong one. Good. This is. Okay. Yes, we can see the screen, the slides. And now it's a duplicator, yes. Okay, um, I can do that. Is that right now? Yes. Thank you. I can start? Yes, please. And the screen is moving, is that right? Yes. Slides, okay. I'd like to thank the APHRS and particularly Abbott for inviting me today to speak to you on right ventricular non-apical pacing. The topic, as I'll go along, you'll understand why I chose this topic and what it means. Traditional sight pacing is from the right ventricular apex. We are now being told that right ventricular apical pacing is non-physiologic and potentially harmful. Harmful in that there is considerable evidence that left ventricular function may worsen after right ventricular pacing, particularly from the apex. Then what are the alternatives to traditional site pacing? We can use the right ventricular septum, we can use dual site right ventricular pacing, or as we've spoken earlier today, his or para his pacing. In all of these cases, we aim to mimic normal cardiac conduction. Today, my topic though, will be on right ventricular septal pacing, how to do it and what the terminology means. Before we can start, let me go through the anatomy of the right ventricle, in particularly as it relates to septal pacing. Here is a cartoon of the right ventricle. The anterior or free wall has been removed and we can see internally. You can divide the right ventricle into three uh, parts. The first and below is the right ventricular apex. Above it are two more areas of the heart and we can go to this imaginary line that moves from the uh, roof of the tricuspid annulus out to the lateral wall that divides this so that we have the right ventricular outflow tract and the mid right ventricle. The septum lies posterior. It lies against the vertebral column. And that's probably one of the most, the reasons why it's difficult to place a lead which we has to go posterior. Another area of importance in the anatomy is the anteroseptal junction. This is the area between the septum and the anterior or free wall. And you know this is the area where the left anterior descending coronary artery goes and then we have in front of it all, the anterior or free wall. Now let's go back to the septum and have a look at the areas from where we can pace. We're now looking at the area above, between the two lines, which is the right ventricular outflow tract. And the area is called the septoparietal trabeculations. This is a cul-de-sac where uh, the lead can easily enter and can be attached. There are very low thresholds, good sensing, and very low dislodgement rate. Just to convince people that this area exists, you can see this area, this cul-de-sac with the uh, red circle from, the, from a, uh, an anatomical specimen, and you can see to the left of that, the tricuspid valve and above it, the pulmonary valve. Now we go back to the septum again, and the area that the way also can pace is the mid septum. I would like to stress at this point that the mid septum, if you're going to pace from there, should be high up. I have recently reviewed papers where 
they have talked about septal pacing. And when I looked at the illustrations, clearly the leads were down at the apex. They may have been on the septum, but this is not the area where you want physiologic pacing. So if we are going to use septal pacing, we have to be up high in the outflow tract area and in the mid septum. Also, we should point out that in the outflow tract, above the septoparietal trabeculations, the area is very, has very poor pacing properties. This is an area of considerable fibrosis and it is not suitable for permanent pacing. So if we're going to use the right ventricular outflow tract, it has to be that particular area which I've outlined. So during implants, how do we know where we are? We use fluoroscopy. Where is the lead in the right ventricle? Well, we use the posterior anterior view. This is initially, of course, with all as we're implanting. We can see here a lead in the right ventricular outflow tract and another in the mid right ventricle. This is usually easy to determine. What about confirming septal positioning? Traditionally, we have used the left anterior oblique 40 degrees. On the left hand side, we can see the PA view with the lead passing to the right. On the right side, we can see the 40 degree LA view view, where the lead also passes to the right. And you can see that there is the vertebral column in the illustration so that we know that we are going backwards. Here is a cartoon of the uh, setup of the right ventricle and left ventricle and the yellow line with the septum. And we aim to place the lead onto that septum. Does the LAO differentiate septal from the anterior or free wall? Well, as far as septal is concerned, as we'll see in a moment, it's not that necessarily very predictable uh, for septal pacing. However, the LAO view is, however, very important to differentiate from anterior or free wall. And you can see here on the right, the lead is passing anterior, exactly opposite to what it was for septal pacing. I think this is a very reliable and the anterior or free wall is the last part of the right ventricle, the least we want to pace because it is thin walled, easy to perforate. Uh, the pacing may not, is not necessarily reliable and most certainly it is not physiological. So that's an area of the heart we want to avoid. Many of the early studies actually had patients with anterior or free wall pacing and that is why these, these studies never showed superiority for areas outside the right ventricular apex. The left lateral, obviously you cannot do this during implantation, but the lead moves backwards from, away from the sternum. But again, I'd like to stress that if it's going forwards, uh, towards the sternum. This is the anterior free wall, and this is to be strongly avoided. The fourth area, a uh, fourth uh, fluoroscopic view is the right anterior oblique. In recent years, we've recognized that this is much, it's quite Im important in determining where the lead is. On the left, you can see the RAO 40 degrees and the lead up against the wall, against the edge of the uh, cardiac uh, silhouette here. True uh, septal pacing lies well back and where this red line is. So this lead is not septal. Here is another case where you can see then the red line, the leads are both leads, one in the right ventricular outflow tract and one in the mid, are well back 
from this, that imaginary line. And as a result of this, this is much more likely to be positioned in the septum. How reliable then, in summary, is fluoroscopy? Fluoroscopy, a cardiac silhouette without well-defined anatomic landmarks. There is variable orientation of the heart in, every, in, in the body. And therefore, we must validate our appearances, our fluoroscopic appearances, against a gold standard. And that standard is CT, cardiac computer tomography. Some of the people who are watching will say, ah, we use echocardiography. The, the problem with echocardiography is that it shows reasonably accurately leads that are down near the apex. But as you move up the heart in towards the right ventricular outflow tract, it is very hard for echocardiographs to accurately determine where you are. So it's cardiac computer tomography is what we need to use. Why? It gives high spatial resolution and multiplanar imaging reformatting means that we can recreate conventional fluoroscopic images. Let's have a look at the short axis view of a cardiac CT. We can see the right ventricle, the left ventricle, and the anterior, inferior, and lateral walls. There is the septum. There is here anterior, the anterior septal junction. And we can see now with the short axis CT view, a lead where the circle is showing it's right in the middle of the septum, an excellent position. Let's now go back and have a look at another case and determine where it is by what we understand from fluoroscopy. The AP view is in that right ventricular outflow tract. The LAO view is going to the right. The left lateral view is going away from the sternum, but the RAO view has the lead up near the uh, edge of the cardiac silhouette so we know that this is, lead may, is probably not going to be on the septum. And when we look at the cardiac CT, the short axis view, we can see there that the lead is now at this area called the anteroseptal junction. And, uh, okay, so what do the studies show? We, uh, had 35 patients who had a cardiac CT, not for pacing reasons, but for other reasons. And they had leads with LAO septal. That is, um, we determined from fluoroscopy that these were septally placed leads and they had a cardiac CT. And sadly, the CT showed septal pacing in only 20% of patients. RAO was very accurate, left lateral was very poor. And most of the leads were clustered around this anteroseptal junction, which we call, I call the natural catch point. It's where the lead wants to go when it enters the heart. This is probably sitting on the septum, but it's right at that junction with the free wall and, it, and we don't really understand if this is physiologic or not. Because we're now questioning the value of fluoroscopy, I prefer to call these areas outside the right ventricular apex, RV non-apical, and hence the title of the talk. How do we place our leads in the right ventricular septum, if it's, that's where we're trying to go? Well, we can see here on this cartoon that the lead has to come through, traverse the tricuspid valve. It then's got to pass acutely posterior going backwards like this. Okay, we have now a, a I have designed a, a stylet with a posterior angulation where we hope to put the lead very posterior after it goes through and traverses the tricuspid valve. When we put the leads into the heart, 
we try to put them into the pulmonary artery and then we retract the lead. So we fully insert the stylet and then we can, there are a number of ways of putting the lead into the pulmonary artery. The direct push doesn't work. We need to somehow prolapse it back into the pulmonary artery. And so we've got these two techniques, apical prolapse and a retrograde loop. Let's have a look at them. The first is the atrial apical prolapse. I'm pushing the lead against the apex. Now, some of you will say, oh, you're going to perforate. Well, remember that there, the stylet has pushed the lead posterior. So it's not against the free wall, it's against the septum. And therefore I have never seen nor heard of a case of perforation doing this. Okay, we then push it further in, further again until it's looped and then it goes into the pulmonary artery. So that's our first step getting it into the pulmonary artery. Let's have a look at a video of this to understand how it does it. Here we are. The time from the right atrium to the pulmonary artery in many of these cases is a matter of only two or three seconds. It just is so simple often to do. Okay, the retrograde loop, as you can see here, you're pushing it in, further looping it, and it goes into the pulmonary artery. Here is a case of where we're doing it. It takes a little longer, but it go, you can get it up into the pulmonary artery. Okay, once we're in the pulmonary artery, we need to deploy our lead, the screw in the right ventricular septum in the, uh, and in this case, going to be the right ventricular outflow tract in the septoparietal trabeculations. You can see the lead in the, pulmon in the pulmonary artery. We can see a red cross, which indicates the area where we want it to go. So all I've done now is I've pulled back the stylet, maybe a centimeter. I have then retracted the lead, pulled it back. It, it then goes across the pulmonary valve and it immediately just flicks straight into the uh, area with that cul-de-sac, which we showed before. Pulling it back even a little further, it'll go into the mid right ventricle, hopefully on the septum. Now, once we have got it into this area, we want to make sure we've used a leave enough loop. Professor C.P. Lau also mentioned this before. If we leave it like this, when the patient stands up, the heart falls, and as a result of that, that lead will dislodge. So we need to put in a significant amount of loop and to make sure that that won't occur. Indeed, I often say, uh, the more loop you leave, the better it is. So um, here is how I tested it. Whoops, sorry. And you can see I'm pushing more and more loop in until the lead uh, buckles at the uh, lower part of the tricuspid valve. When I see that, I pull back. I pull back about two centimeters and that's the final position. So that's the final position. This was the beginning. And you can see there's a considerable amount of lead in there. This, remember, is one of the most important parts of your implantation as you do not want to have uh, lead dislodgement. It can be positioned in both the right ventricular outflow tract or the mid right ventricle, as you can see in these cases here. I've done about 750 insertions. I hadn't been implanting for seven or eight years now, but over that time beforehand, I did 750 insertions I had three dislodgements, but what is important is I had 94% of the pacing thresholds at implant were less than one volt. In other words, they were 0.9 or less than that again. So it's an outstanding area for pacing thresholds. Indeed, 
at the end of one year, the highest stimulation threshold that I recorded was 1.5 volts. We had about a 2% failure with severe tricuspid regurgitation. This was early on in my experience. And then by altering the curve of the stylet that I used, we were able to eradicate that problem completely. And in fact, severe tricuspid regurgitation is not difficult at all if you've got the correct wide uh, stylet. It's very safe. Here is the stylet that I uh, created. There is this important posterior angulation. The usual way is to prepare it in the cath lab as you're uh, implanting the lead. I used to test my fellows in creating this and I had the most bizarre array of different uh, uh, shapes that they used to prepare. But what was important is that a significant number of them actually did the posterior displacement part the wrong way. In other words, they were doing it so there would be anterior displacement. And in fact, these patients would have had leads put in in the, um, in the, in the free wall, where the last part is I, last place, I said where you wanted to place it. So as a result of that, I worked with uh, St. Jude Medical Abbott in creating a stylet. The stylet has a number of advantages. It is made of tempered steel. That means that the shape is created and then it's heated. So that, and that shape re is retained. If you hand uh, uh, create the stylet, the shape uh, you often remove from the lead is nothing like the original one. In other words, it has no memory. But these, this is very hard to actually distort the shape of this uh, commercially available stylet. So it's, it's a way of getting to the area, I believe, more reliably. Yes, it does have the name Mond on it, uh, but I might point out that this has nothing to do with me. It means the magnificent outflow tract navigational device. So I'd like to finish off here. I, I, before we uh, take questions, I know that the questions, the first question is going to be, is it physiologically proven that non-apical pacing is superior to apical pacing? And the answer is no, we haven't proven that. The reason probably we haven't proven it is that the leads that were put into the heart have been put into all parts of the uh, non-apical uh, region, including the free wall, and if you have some patients who have got septal pacing and some patients who have got free wall pacing and mix them together, you're not going to get the appropriate result. I, I've looked through all the studies. Clearly, none of them show that septal or non-apical pacing is superior. None of them show it's inferior to apical pacing, and that's important. We also know that it has a very low uh, complication rate when, pro when properly, properly implanted. And we don't, I don't think the right studies have been done to date. My, own fe my feeling is that it, it's probably physiologically superior. We haven't proven it, but there's most certainly complication rate and ease of implantation makes it, I think, superior to apical pacing. I also like to just finish off by saying in, this, in these troubled times with the pandemic, uh, teaching has fallen away, at least face-to-face -face teaching. As a result of this, for my fellows and other technicians, I have recently created a series of ECGs called Fun with ECGs, which are general and pacemaker, they're both of them. They're not supremely co complicated things, they're teaching cases. And 
I have now got a large number of people to where I send these out to approximately once a week. If you would like to join this group, there is my uh, email address, or you also can get my email address from Jeremy, who, and uh, I'd be delighted to uh, put you in the group and re to receive these case studies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Harry, for your um, sharing uh, all the, this informative uh, lectures. Uh, Professor Kwa, do you have any additional uh, information? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Harmond. Uh, I listen to this uh, topic uh, a few times. It's, uh, each time I still got them very uh, impressive. Uh, so today there are some uh, questions from audience, so ask the question for them. So the first question is, uh, what is the best placement RV lead between RVOT and the middle settlement? I don't really think there is much difference and it hasn't been proven. Both of them are close to each other, provided you place the mid uh, uh, right ventricular leads high up. If you place them near the apex of the heart, I think you're effectively just getting apical pacing. Okay, the second question is, uh, are there specific ECG characterized we are looking out for to confirm septal RVOT pacing versus free world pacing? I've looked at hundreds and hundreds of ECGs in this regard. Uh, Professor Lau talked about uh, the typical findings which he called septal pacing. In fact, they are the typical findings of right ventricular outflow tract pacing. There is a very small R wave or an S wave in lead one, two and three or, and AVF are very positive. And there are R waves in V5 and V6. Now that's the typical right ventricular outflow tract uh, pacing. With apical pacing, it is a left axis deviation and it is a left bundle branch block with no R waves in V5, V6. And as you creep upwards towards the right ventricular outflow tract, the uh, R wave in one disappears, the R waves in two and three become present. And so you can see, you can actually work out where your lead is, but you cannot tell whether it's on the septum or actually at the um, enteroseptal junction or even on the free wall. Okay. Uh, <coughs> another question is, uh, how to easily manage to reach a septal pacing in severe tricuspid regurgitation patient? How you how to easily get there? Yeah, I showed the, I, sh I showed the techniques. I showed the techniques of try of getting from uh, the right atrium through to the pulmonary artery and then retract the lead and it. In general, provided the right ventricular uh, size is normal, the lead falls into those areas very easily. If it's a very large right ventricle, particularly in patients with tricuspid regurgitation and atrial fibrillation, these cases are much more difficult. And using a broader, uh, uh, <coughs> using a broader, uh, stylet with uh, it means that you can actually use it better in the right large right ventricular chamber so abbott have actually created two different types of stylet one for standard use and one for when the right ventricle is very large okay you, uh, can i uh, just uh, quickly check with uh, dr ma or dr wang do you have any uh, additional uh, information about your uh, comments about um, where to put, your, especially the lead uh, in LV septum, apical or uh, LVOT, what is your preference? 
without Dr. Wang or Dr. Ma, do you want to comment? For me, I also have stopped placing the RV lead in the apical position for many years. Of course, in my practice is not, not, not as long as uh, Professor Mon, but I've stopped doing that for many years. Now, I usually put it in the RV OT or the RV septum, as um, rightly pointed out by Professor Mon. Um, but the challenge is always with the, the severe tricuspid regurgitation. Um, I would like to ask Professor Mon again. Just now, you mentioned that you had you had about two percent uh, failure in implantation in those patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation. Um, if I may ask you, what do you do differently um, to achieve success in the later parts of your practice? <laughs> in the latter half of those 750, I had no problems at all. And I was just amazed. What I used was the large curve, uh, the wide curve on the stylet and this then allowed the, uh, the tip of the lead to go against, to run itself down the wall and get into the, either the mid uh, right ventricle or into the uh, septoparietal trabeculations. So indeed, we, we could predict beforehand. We would see the, on fluoroscopy how big the heart was, or we knew about it from echocardiography. We knew the patient had atrial fibrillation. They all have atrial fibrillation. And we mm. knew the patient has severe tricuspid regurgitation. Yep. And in those cases, I would choose the broad stylet immediately and we had no trouble getting in. So I, I was just amazed at how, in the end, simple it was, something that was, in fact, extremely difficult uh, without, with the normal stylet, yeah. And most certainly with the hand fashion stylets, we had lots of trouble with these cases. Yes, I agree. First one, and you just yes. uh, introducing the indication for pacing. So in your practice, now what kind of patient you choose the RVOT septal pacing? Actually, for more than 10 years, I also uh, stopped doing epical pacing. So uh, I would always try to go to Mistetum or uh, RBOT as what uh, my mentor, Professor uh, Mong, just mentioned. Only one exception is those patients with uh, Hocken, obstructive, hypertrophy of obstructive cardiomyopathy. Then I would go to low septum, uh, but still not in the epical pacing. One KBR for, uh, for the uh, audience, for, for people who listen to this, a lecture. It's very important to check the patient's uh, chest x-ray and echo uh, uh, data uh, at least one day earlier uh, before the, this uh, implantation procedure. If you see a huge uh, cardiac silhouette on the chest x-ray, uh, you better ask the company reps to prepare a long dense lead just, uh, for, uh, in case uh, sometimes the problem is that the uh, 50 a 60 centimeter dense may not be enough for patients with huge dry atrium. That's something very important. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, good. Okay, uh, Jeffrey, I think it's uh, time is uh, is okay now. We'll finish. Okay, uh. I think uh, there's still many questions, but it's uh, uh, maybe in the after meeting we can uh, collect the question and uh, send the question to the all these uh, speakers. Uh, so today, uh, <coughs> three professors give a uh, wonderful lectures uh, about uh, basic concept and the indication pacemaker indication and also pacemaker implantation technique and also red ventricle non epical pacing. Uh, thank you all these uh, speakers give wonderful uh, <coughs> lectures. I think, uh, and also uh, thanks all the audience uh, participating in this uh, wonderful course. And the uh, next, uh, uh, next uh, course is will be August 15th. It's also about uh, the uh, cardiorhythmic device therapy. So welcome to next uh, uh, part of uh, the course. So thanks again for the, all the speakers and all the audience that participated in the course. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hua, for to be our chairperson of today.
and leading the, today's uh, discussion. And thanks a lot, all our speakers, uh, Harry, um, Dr. Wang, and Professor Lau, and also uh, Dr. Ma. I look forward to your uh, teaching uh, uh, two weeks later. All Pleasure. right. Thank yeah, I, and I hope can see uh, everyone of you again uh, to, uh, on 15th of uh, August. I, and I hope you all are staying safe and uh, healthy. Thank you for joining today and goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Be safe. Yep. Thank you.